Welcome to the World Builder's Anvil, episode 116, Simple, Succinct, Technology Level Method. Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place that will help prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builder's Anvil. I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram. Let's sup from the mug of Java and build. Hello, welcome back. This is Jeffrey W. Ingram, and I want to do a faithful reintroduction due to a technical glitch not caused by myself at all. Welcome back. As always, I'm Jeffrey W. Ingram. And I'm Michael Miller. Well, hello, Michael. How are you doing today? Oh, Jeff, you're cool. You should just call me Mike. Okay, just don't go back on that later. Oh, I will. I'm a hypocrite. You're so cool. Why don't you just go to the topic? When we're talking about technology systems, there are a gambit of things that you can do. We've talked before about the GURPS technology system, which is... Which we're both big fans of. Which we're both big fans of, and actually is sort of the basis for how I track it for my world. And this is really important to <laughs> keep into consideration when you're talking about a framework-style world. Because it will pr progress as you go into the future, and it'll give you a simple way to be able to update a lot of cultures very quickly. What do you mean by framework style world? Do you mean like what it's not fleshed out, or a, a framework style world means it's a world that is a framework for stories to happen in? Okay. So you have a bunch of cultures that you might or might not be using. It's the complete world. That way, you can sort of pick when and where you want to do stories at, much like oh, Guard Duel. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a way I actually track the tech levels for my world, um, being a framework-based world. I would not suggest this, however, if, if you are creating a world for a story. Um, it, it's probably more than you need, unless you need a quick reference to be able to tie it back to our world to let you know, you know the kinds of equipment that might or might not be around. So... Um to reference our types of world builder if you're gunslinging the story this probably you probably don't need this but if you're yeah. but if you're even definitely if you're an architect if you're a, a gardener a gardener you'll probably want this too. yeah you know if you're really planning to use the world more than once because later on you're going to go back and even if it's in the same time period you, you want to be consistent with uh the, the persistence of technology mm. and you know what? Uh, I feel like I keep falling back on those terms, which I like to fall back on. Um, gunslinger, uh, gardener, and architect. Mm -hmm. uh, what episode number was that from? You don't know it. Something after 79. <clears throat> Something after 79. Um, but I will put the actual link to that show okay. in this episode. If you haven't heard the episode where we talk about the different types of world builders, you should definitely watch. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of a cardinal episode because we make reference to it a lot. Yeah. So, And I will also uh, put a link into the technology level episode I did very early on. And this is really the exact system that I use. And it's a system for you to steal, modify, or use upon your whim. Um, but the idea is that you want an easy way to know where the people of your world are at when you're telling stories. And especially when you start having multiple states, multiple cultures, that they, they might not all be at the same place at the same time. The one flaw I have with the GURP system is there's an implication that if you have space engines that all of the other technology that your world uses is in is the same level. era. Yeah. And I don't like that because I don't want to make it too specific. Like, well, I'm sorry, your astrophysics is not to that level yet, but I have it broken down a little bit more because I want to know sort of big area things, things that I find important where they're at. And cultures due to their norms are going to push ahead in certain areas first and the other areas will lag behind. And over time, it might change what their focus is. I want to take a step backwards here mm -hmm. just to explain something really basic because uh, to quote Stan Lee, any comic book, it, every comic book is potentially somebody's first comic book. Yeah. And I feel the same way about podcasts. Any mm -hmm. podcast is potentially somebody's sure. first episode. Um, so if you're not familiar with how tech level works, the basic gist is what we're talking about is 
the level of technology in a given culture at a given time compared to earth compared or using earth as a mm-hmm. as a benchmark yeah. um so every different culture it, it's not the same mm-hmm. like you know if we go find some hidden you know tribe in south america they might be at a tech level where they're just using like spears and and bows and arrows mm-hmm. but if you go to you know modern warfare in america we've got you know, sophisticated, you know, everything, everything, you know, yeah. uh, so the warfare t- technology level is dramatically different. Mm-hmm. And and so essentially to give you a brief breakdown of <clears throat> some of the areas that we talk about in um, or I talk about in the technology level is essentially like think of, you know, you're comparing it to a Stone Age Earth, a Bronze Age Earth, an Iron Age Earth, early or late Middle Ages, Renaissance and and you have these different eras up through to, to today, which would be a sort of a post-industrial world. And then going out into the future, you might have things like, you know, early space age. I'm trying to think what they called. Um, there's a term. Oh, is this, is this it right Th- here? That is our term. <laughs> well, these are the terms you're using. Mm-hmm. Which are based off of those. Well, post-industrial and industrial are two different eras. Right. I know I understand that. But then you have early global and global. And um, we might, we're might we really actually probably there. Yeah. yeah. But there is a, a real world terminology. And I'm forgetting the term. It's killing me. For the age we're in now. And they're wrong because you can't make up terms for the age you're in because you don't really know. It's like you can't determine who a good president is if you've lived under their administration. Yeah, you got to wait. Um, you know, in 100 years, they'll have a term for today. <clears throat> well, my point is I'm pretty sure they have a term now like the like the internet age or whatever the heck it is. It, or, yeah, but whatever. This is a fantasy we're talking about, not Earth. Even though we're talking well, about Well, we are Earth. talking about Earth <laughs> in comparison to a fantasy. Okay. So, why why are we doing this? Okay. So, uh, once again, this is the idea for people to be able to track it for their states or their cultures. So, they have an easy reference whenever they go back to material at that time to advance the world forward to a future time. They know where the basis was, where, where they stopped developing the culture. And um, so, so the culture was in like the brass age and then they're telling a story 300 years later, they should have advanced past the brass they age. They probably should point. have advanced in some, some of the areas, maybe other areas they're, they're not advanced in. And now the areas I like to look at and we'll kind of go over just one at a time and then we'll sum it up again at the end. But the first, the first area, and I think probably the most important because this is what starts off what we call civilization or we think starts off civilization, which is agriculture. And there are a couple of different ways of thinking about agriculture. Uh, there are some people who don't do it. We call those hunters and gatherers. Uh, there are people who do agriculture. We call them farmers. Farmers. <laughs> and then there are people who actually uh, are nomadic like hunter and gatherers. But instead of hunting and ga- gathering, they have domesticated animals that travel with them. And you still see this a lot today in sort of sub-Sahara Africa. There's a lot of tribes that will actually... They're moving herds around, but they're, they're moving like a nomadic tribe. Mm-hmm. They don't have the stationary farms, but they have their sort of own method for uh, how they gather. Food. So I assume like at that point, the reference is that they're moving around based on the animals having a su- food supply in a yeah, area. Essentially, the, you know, as the pasture <laughs> wears thin, they're moving to a, a new pasture area, and then the animals will eat there for a while, and they'll keep moving around. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, agriculture is very important for anyone. Because if you don't have a stable food supply, you cannot have people stop making food and start making other things. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not impossible. And there are examples of cultures on Earth that actually started cities before they knew how to do agriculture. At least that's the current belief. Uh, they're not very many, but they had enough excess food to where some people could start becoming artisans, you know, could start doing what we would call the trades today. But in general, once you get agriculture, people start to settle down. And once they start settling down, people can start doing other types of tasks. And as the food, as they become better at creating food supply, more time is freed up, more new tasks are created. And, and that's when you start getting into more modern era where very few people actually work for food production now. Mm-hmm. And you have a lot of very specialized t- types of jobs where Mike is uh, an electrician. 
Uh, Michael. Michael is an electrician. My, Michael is as well. Okay, wow. Weird coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I'm an IT analyst. Um, so two different Which means jobs. He, he analyzes it. I, that means I don't if do I say, any actual work. If I say <laughs> analyze it, then you go to the IT analyst and he analyzes it. Yeah. And because I don't do any actual work, so I had to come up with a different title than, you know, <laughs> developer. Or my something. my actual job title is pretty complicated. <laughs> it's like lead field installation technician for monitoring of electrical. Oh, it's crazy. That's very impressive title. Your title I, is I'm bigger pr- than mine. I'm, I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure that my <laughs> that my job title is longer than anybody else's at my company, even though I'm relatively low on the totem pole. Yeah, but you know. Who needs the money when you can have a big job? I don't title? care about the title. I'll take the money. <laughs> I'll take every time. I will take the money. So greedy. <clears throat> um, I will say this. One of these days, like once I get my E1, um, I am going to have business cards made up and they will say Michael Miller, mm-hmm. electrician and adventurer. Very good. That's what they will say. That's awesome. Thing. Ask me why. Why? Watch the movie House 2. House 2. Yes. In that movie, um, uh, the guy who plays Cliff Clavin. Um, uh, I, I, I do, know, I do know his name, but anyway, he, he comes in and they find like a dimensional portal in a wall and he's like, Oh, you got your basic, uh, extra dimensional, uh, portal in the <laughs> wall here. Cause he came to check yeah. the elect, the wiring and he starts pulling the wire and it starts ripping a big, huge hole in the wall. <laughs> then he opens up his toolbox, removes the top shelf and underneath his tools in the top shelf is a saber. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I got you guys. Come on. And he pulls the sword out and then they go through. And when he leaves, he's like, if you ever need me, like he goes, they go on this whole adventure in the wall into another dimension, mm-hmm. very Indiana Jones. And when they come back out, he's like, ah, you ever need me? Give me a call again. He hands him the card. It says electrician and adventurer. <laughs> well, that would be a very good title. For so I think I need to get the business card and I need that business card, but I won't do it until it's true. Yes. So I haven't had it made yet. So, but that's a good lead into energy. So we're talking yeah. about like once you're once you have a a, a culture and they've established agriculture, mm-hmm. they can start developing other things. Like they're yes. not they're not if you can't if if you if if you're constantly worrying about food, you're mm-hmm. constantly worrying about food. Yes, but once that's no longer a once concern, it's no longer a concern, what what's happened in humanity and and probably most species that develop intelligence. I'm guessing I I won't say for your species, but in general. All my species sort of behave this way. They look for ways. I think you and I are the same species. Up to about fantasy species in people's worlds. Oh, so you're talking listening. about your species versus my yeah. species. Gotcha. No, yeah. We're, we, I believe, technically are the same species. I, I, think, I, I'm a, I think I'm a higher evolutionary level than you, though. That's not saying That's much. probably true. Uh, <laughs> okay. But um, energy. <laughs> pe- people will start looking for ways to do the things that they currently do easier. And I'd say animals is probably the first step. Animals are probably the most basic form, I would imagine, of uh, the easiest to develop way to uh, stop wasting your energy when you can have an, have, an yeah. animal pull your plow. Yeah, well, not even. I mean, we go like at very early agriculture, it's like a log that, you know, uh, they got like a log and it's tied to an oxen and he's just dragging along the field to level well, up. Well, actually, the that's, dirt. that's probably the second phase. The first phase are probably people out there manually do well i'm talking yeah. animals we're talking animals jeff but i'm saying the animals become very important <laughs> early with that uh, not all cultures on earth have developed the kinship we have with animals mm. one of the problems uh the americas had when the europeans came over was they brought animal domesticated animals and the uh people who were native to the americas never went that way yeah and so the problem was a lot of the diseases that we had picked up wiped out massive numbers of people over here, probably made the colonization of <laughs> North and South America possible. Yeah. And um, it probably would have, it would, they would have the same issues they had trying to colonize Africa at the time. They would kind of go in, build these posts on the shore. And the and, and even at the time when colonization in the, the Americas started to happen, they were already trying this in Africa and it wasn't working. The kingdoms, even though they were probably a little bit behind in technology, would just push them away mm-hmm. because – the European technology was not significantly advanced to push around uh, people really far from their homes. Mm-hmm. But uh, energy is important. So, you you know, you you look at, you know, in the Stone Age, typically it's animals, maybe a wheel. Yeah, I was going to say windmills. Uh, windmills, things that use rivers. A lot of early cultures water, water wheels. develop along rivers for two reasons. It's easy to do transportation on rivers. Um, it's easier than coming up with a road system like the Romans or the Incas. 
And they have also have you been on the Incan roads? Uh, not yet, but I do want to. I, I have, will. I have. You've been. To, I've been to Machu Picchu. I no, that's Peru, isn't it? I'm not sure exactly where it is in the modern world. <laughs> I'm pretty I sure. I just know it's in the top of I'm, the mountains. I'm pretty yeah. sure Machu Picchu is in Peru. I was in, oh, you know what? You said Incan. I, I was at the Aztec roads. Yeah. And something neat that they, that they did was they actually crushed up a lot of, cause of course they're right near the shore. They crushed up, uh, shells. They mm-hmm. crushed up all kinds of shells and they laid that in the pavement because the moonlight hits it and it doesn't, oh, it, looks- it doesn't light it up. But it's a lot lighter than the dirt and the forest floor. So you floor. can kind of see you the road. You can see it. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's astounding because here's this road. Like, I, honestly, I don't know how old they were. Mm-hmm. I, I, obviously, a few hundred years old, maybe as much as a thousand. I'm yeah. not sure. But the fact that it still remains today. I mean, yeah. it's a path. It's only about eight feet wide. But the fact that it's still there. I want to mention one thing that truly embarrasses me about the modern industrial, <clears throat> post-industrial, global world. Our roads are pathetic. Our roads are terrible. And where it might keep people employed, uh, the problem is that it doesn't free up their labor to do other things. Mm. But now I remember when we went to Italy for my 10th anniversary, um, and uh, the first place we stopped and went to was Florence, which is inland a bit. So you you get off at the port and then you take a van to the city of Florence. I remember them going, okay, now if you look out of the van here, you're going to see the Appian Way. Now, if you don't know what the Appian Way was, that was the road that Julius Caesar marched his legions down where he crossed the Rubicon and essentially declared war on the Senate by doing that. That road is still in use as a highway in Italy, along with most of the other Roman roads that were built because they were built that well. You know, the sewer system and, in Rome... And, and was, is just their, like, all marble roads? Like, what Like what did they well, use? They, that- they used sand mixed with... Um, it, it was sort of the same idea of how they built the um, their concrete, where it was volcanic sand mixed in with stuff to do the top layer mm-hmm. and, and they used obsidian as well so very very hard road well i was gonna say it would have to be incredibly hard yeah. that erosion over mm-hmm. time would I, I mean i don't know what kind of weather they get there obviously our, our roads in new england are rough because our weather is horrible it tears them apart and tar is soft and that's the thing is the materials we choose to use are different it was like too like you know you go to like rome and you're in the form of rome that was originally a swamp because it was it was at the bottom of of the hills in Rome was where the forum was originally built. It had a torrential downpour the day before he we went there, not a lick of liquid anywhere because the the roads are so hard it just rolls away. But not just that though, the sewers built in 500 BC are so effective still that it, when it rains, it drains it all off into the sewers very quickly because they turn it from they turn it from a swamp to dry land by building sewers underneath it. And those sewers are still being used today where I know where I live in Connecticut, we have to pay extra money every year because our hundred year old uh, sewers are so out of shape. So, you know, there's something about, you know, newer technology does not mean better built. Yeah. Um, it, it, mean, it, means, it usually means a lot faster built. It usually means faster built and maybe less resources to build it. Mm-hmm. So it'd probably be a lot. It's probably a lot cheaper, cheaper to, build, yeah. to build roads the way we do them the way Romans did. But uh, their roads are still around, so maybe there's something to be said about coming up with some kind of compromise. There. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, but uh, when you when you also you number two there is energy. Um, mm-hmm. Do you are you also referring to? You're not talking about electrical energy yet, right? not yet. But that would okay. be at a higher tech level. Well, that's what I would think. It, that's why yeah. I would think that once you get down into like the scientific or whatever. No, no, energy is really all about what type of energy level are you at at producing. Mm-hmm. So. If you're in the industrial age, you're you're at the ability to pull up coal and sort of that level, but it's about producing energy. Okay. Now, obviously, you might need the scientific level to <clears throat> get some of those things. Yeah, you, or to utilize it. Because the funny thing about the way technology advances is when you need two pieces mm-hmm. of, of the pie uh, or the puzzle. Um, for instance, we created canning and preserving food mm-hmm. long before we figured out the can opener. Yeah. Like they, they figured, that's funny. They, yeah. they figured out, I want to say it's like 50 to 100 years mm-hmm. that able prior, like they were able to can food, mm-hmm. but they didn't know how to open it without destroying the food inside the can. And that's also one of the ironies of why when you think of a traditional can for food, you're not talking about a can because of that. You're talking about a mason jar. Well, but yeah, you can open, but the you reason can open, they use you can them, open a mason yeah. jar. Yeah. 
the, but that's the reason why they used them because, like you said, they couldn't open the can. They, they couldn't figure out a can opener. If you ever find an old World War II MRE, they have the best can openers. Did did you? You're talking the little fold over job. Yes, they came with the MRE. The, that was it was the, they didn't call it MRE. It was a C ration. Well, like the C ration, whatever. My point is yep. that you got one with it because I thought that was a distributed piece of equipment that came along it with. Might your have kit. been I. My understanding was it was part Packed, of the kit, yeah. but maybe you only got one every so often or something. Yeah. Maybe I'm a little That's, off with I, that. that is one piece of equipment that I, I still haven't gotten around to buying that I want on my keychain. I would probably it, use it most, once every five years, but it is, it is the, the most the effective little um, uh, portable can opener. Yeah, um, and I, I knew people in the service who had them, and they they worked just as good in the '90s as they probably did back mm, then. Yeah. yeah. Now, after energy, one of the important early things is communication. Mm. And the ability to communicate really is a dividing line for um, the the extent of a culture, the extent of a state, because if the will of the emperor cannot be issued out to the hinterlands, <laughs> um, they split up over time because it's hard to control it. Quick movie reference. Watch The Postman. Yes. Yes, and and it all comes back to Kevin Costner post apocalyptic post apocalyptic films, Jeff. Yes, it does. Beyond Waterworld, The Postman. Yeah, the, yeah, Postman. Yeah, um, and Waterworld. What what the one with all the water? It's a world, and there's lots of water. I guess there are boats. I must not have seen it, or I think my you, brain you is might, yeah, memory might, of it. My brain refuses to accept the existence <laughs> of such a thing. So the Postman, but no, yeah, communication uh, exactly like if it. Even you take a look at everyone so big on The Walking Dead, mm -hmm. when they finally find out that there's other colonies, mm -hmm. the fact that they start communicating. Like, if you can't communicate with other people, how do you expect to create trade routes and know what 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 things they make that you can use and exactly. thus cross-pollinate each other with your own – with different technologies or – uh, medicines, food, um, tools, mm -hmm. weapons. That's why my personal belief was very early – you know, and this, you know, uh, previous to the Stone Age, even through maybe the Iron Age, is where most of the really distinctive culture types developed. Um, and once you start getting past the Iron Age, because the communication levels and the ways they do it are better, what happens is you start getting so much cross pollination that it it, it would be hard unless someone's very isolated to grow into a to, to remain a completely unique culture. Mm. Um, I mean, they have trade. So what you're saying is we're all going to be the Borg soon. We are all the Bar Borg already. You didn't. No one told you. They don't have to because we have a hive mind. Remember? Oh, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, look! I wasn't even looking at your. I wasn't even looking at your list. And the next thing is trades. Yes, I did. I wasn't even looking at that. The trades is very important, and you could say trades slash manufacturing because at a certain point. Oh. Types I, of trades. I was taking a look at that as in trading. You mean like, um, like work trades, like work trades. Gotcha. Artisan. Like this guy's a stonemason. Mm -hmm. This guy is a, a plumber. This guy builds roads. Mm -hmm. And and the types of jobs show up as things become <clears throat> relevant. Like you, blacksmith. You, you're not building a coal plant until you can make coal power. Uh, mm -hmm. There's just no point. And you'd be like, wow, this is a great structure now. If we could find something to burn in that, we could make electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, well, even even when when um, uh, Tesla and Edison were were, were developing uh, electrical distribution and 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 the ways to uh, utilize it, like I mean, you, I have seen this. I have I've come across fixtures in New England because New England is a very old area of the United States that were gas fixtures. Mm -hmm. but they had been converted over to electrical. So they actually disconnected the oh, gas pipes, cool. but yeah. they, they fed electrical wires into the pipes. I've only seen it a couple times. So here's you know Edison and, and Tesla working on electricity, working on how to – and the big thing was lights. Mm -hmm. If you can get lights going at night, people can work at night. Yes, if you don't lights. have light at night, then you can't work at night. So all the gas lamps that were throughout mm -hmm. all these towns, like one of their first big things was how do we get public lighting mm -hmm. on electricity? Yeah. And light is one of those things that, and I've talked about these in a few other episodes where there are certain things that people really don't respect mm -hmm. the invention of and lights essentially doubled the productivity of humanity. Yeah. And my point is that while they were developing electricity and doing things with it, that's great. But most 
places and businesses and people had no use for electricity yet. They had no means. We didn't have, I mean, you just go down to Home Depot and buy a motor, an electrical mm-hmm. motor. Like I'm not even talking if you, if you're like, let me buy a, a bathroom fan mm-hmm. or a washer and dryer. Of course they use motors, but just like a basic, you know, uh, like a squirrel cage motor. Mm-hmm. People, I didn't have, people didn't have that. Yes. Like a, a, a local business that could use that motor to build something, they didn't have them mm-hmm. because they, they didn't have electricity to, yeah. to, to run them. So if it's like, you know, the cart before the horse thing, it's like, okay, well, great. You have electricity, but no one has any means to utilize it yeah. yet. So it was a slow development. Yeah. And but, once the light bulb came, that's when it took <clears> off. <throat> right. And, and for good reasons, like I said, it really, it almost doubled humanity's output in places that had electricity amazing amazing stuff you can work longer into the night you, you could go home multiple ships. someone else exactly none of that was really possible before and at least not if without, you did at least not without fire hazards i was, was going to say <laughs> it, it would reduce the number of fires much like sort of the franklin stove saved a lot of lives electricity saved a lot of lives because you had less candles getting knocked over mm-hmm. and uh or people Walking through the house carrying the candle, mm-hmm. um, and and falling down the stairs, knocking their head open, and the whole house went down, and everyone died. It's a pretty extreme example you're pointing out there, Jeff. Oh yeah, I'm just, just- I mean, I would have gone with something <laughs> just as tr- just as tragic, but maybe a little more common, like um, uh, uh, the factory, the clothing factories, um, uh, textile mills, yeah. which were obviously super fire hazards. So if mm-hmm. you can remove the fire from a very large fire hazard and add electric lighting, then yeah, I'm sure pre- places that made newspapers and places that make clothes probably shifted to electricity very <laughs> yeah, yeah, quick. Yeah, yeah. And, and some trades are the basic things that you think about. We think of trades like an electrician. A, I well, a I would go more basic than that. Just a builder. You need people, yeah. someone to build buildings. Mm-hmm. That's first. Yeah, and uh. And so, as, and some of these, you know, you're going to see a development in them, much like you would in history, where they stay, they 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 move into what they call cottage industries, which are literally small cottages of people who are skilled at that technique, where they come together. Someone else worries about getting the clothes. Someone else worries about all of that stuff. And you essentially, specializations. People can, can become more specialized. Then over time, factories start potentially coming up. And then they start supplanting the things. And that's one thing to keep in mind when technology advances, it will cause turmoil in societies, especially depending on the types of advancements that happen. Like when, you know, you had the cottage industry replaced by uh, factories, uh, there were a lot of very upset people at factories. You know, you see, uh, you're going to see more of that even today with more and more robots are going to take people's jobs. Mm. And then it creates turmoil because if it happens to you, you don't know where your labor will be shifted to. And sometimes temporarily labor can even go backwards. That's where you see, well, we have more service industries right now where people are working at McDonald's because they lost their factory job. Mm. And so it, it creates a lot of turmoil in these periods. And the resolution is always unknown. And oddly, at least to date, has something new comes up. Like my theory is, Right now, as we've seen a a massive reduction in people working in manufacturing will increase. Um, There will be a point where the cheap labor overseas people are currently worried about becomes too expensive. Some of those jobs will come back here at that point, but most of them will turn into robots because as the automation becomes cheaper, the people who are in those industries are going to look for a way to provide the lowest cost product to the consumer because consumers will almost always pick that over uh, the made in America or whatever, Mm -hmm. whatever the thing is. My personal belief is in the next 20 years, we're going to start seeing a big push towards getting us to the ash boy belts. And that's where a lot of human labor is going to start shifting is into things that are newer, more difficult that we don't know how to automate. And it's going to really, we're going to start propelling into space because of this. And that labor is going to start. You're talking in the next 20 years, did you say? Oh, yes. And don't, and don't be wrong. Not everyone will be moving there. But within the next 20 years, there will at least be a plan put together, if not early attempts and and. Uh, Are you just talking like sending like probes out there to the asteroid? Right oh, we've or seen you, probes. Oh, you probes mean putting a, you put a, put a man out there, you mean? We'll be putting people out there, be it probably moon first and then from the moon to asteroids, uh, just because 
there's so many wealth and resources in the asteroid belt, uh, like um, gold. There's like trillions of dollars in some of these asteroids. Yeah, but if if they if they manage to start dragging it from there all the way back to Earth, mm -hmm. it's just going to devalue it over time, of course. Yes, but all those resources are needed to do more things, which will create more industries here on Earth. True. True. So it's hard to know, and I'm guessing because when you look at the future, you're just guessing. Yeah. Because if, if it was so easy to guess what the next thing was, when the when when the factories were first being built in in Europe, where the monarchs ruled, the monarchs would have said, "Okay, now everyone go work over there. Everyone start opening up uh, stores and restaurants mm -hmm. because that's what we're going to need next." And people aren't really we're not as good as we think we are at predicting the future. But that's just my personal guess from what I follow in technology. So, uh, trades, and then you got transportation, transportation. Up there, which you're kind of talking about on a very well, we're talking much about more advanced, a higher level. High, much higher level. Uh, you'd be surprised, not that much more advanced than what we have. Well, I mean, w when you're talking like you're going from, uh, you know, basic trades and small culture and transportation, I'm thinking like literally horse and wagon, and eventually uh, mm -hmm. like uh, roads and trains, so you can move yeah. mass quantities, mm -hmm. just like what you're talking about, like. Uh, um, uh, resources, mm -hmm. you know, coal, uh, lumber, um, any basic building, yeah. uh, stone, mm -hmm. um, basic building supplies. So, yep, steel. Yeah, no, and and the big thing to remember is most of these things in a non magical world build off of each other. You know, your transportation when that when you get a new advancement there, it's going to actually spur advancements in some other areas mm -hmm. because wait, now I get a whole bunch of lumber back, and the number of people who do woodworking, more people start doing woodworking. Some of the people who are woodworking start to specialize and do other types of things in woodworking that you just couldn't do before because you didn't have enough wood to keep up with the demand to build structures. But now the structures are built and people are now making things out of wood. But yeah, so that's exactly what transportation is. And that gets you up to those spaceships to take us out to the asteroids and beyond. Um, I was looking forward to it too. And it it's sad because I'll be dead before it happens. Um, just teleportation. That's what I want. Yes. And there's a very good book. Tiger Tiger uh, was the original name. I have to try and figure out what it's. They lost a lawsuit, I believe. And, and the name was changed. Re retitled it. And I don't know why because it was well before I was born. So I don't know why the other name is stuck in my brain. Well, see, that's kind of <laughs> funny because it's like Mind Killer by, um, by Spider Robinson also changed mm -hmm. titles. And I don't know why. Yeah. And uh, I read this one in college, and it was all about, you know, there's one guy who just one day teleported. And it really sucked to be him because, like, the government of his country was, like, grabbed him. and uh, Well, couldn't he, he just teleport away? He, he disappeared. He didn't even know did how he, he did it. Did he do it, or did it, it, was, it wasn't with it, the advent of a machine? It was an evolutionary step in humanity. Started. Really? And, um, and, but the cool thing with the book isn't really, it's not about him. It's about sort of. Uh, as it's become mainstream later on, there's like an anecdotal story about him and how society changes when people can just teleport places. This world would be a wonderful but also terrifying place. Well, it's wonderful like, that we wouldn't have to pay for travel anymore. We yeah. could just go someplace. Terrible in that there would be no, there would no longer be borders and terrorists could go anywhere. So, and one of the interesting things that they talked about, and this is just one little tidbit I'll give away. Really rich people made moving houses. Not that the house moved location, but walls would be continually shifting and adjusting in their homes at all times. The rooms would be kept very dark because people had the limitations. They had to be able to visualize it. Mm -hmm. And so if it was dark and always constantly shifting, people would never be able to teleport to that spot. Oh, I see. So uh, it was just one of the interesting consequences of the, the uh, author's mind. <clears throat> and imagine if it was a case where, uh, like in Terminator, they could only be sent back in time uh, organically. So if I could only mm -hmm. teleport myself but not my clothing. Mm -hmm. Imagine if everybody could teleport but only themselves. So everybody would just be naked. Hello, like, Naples. Like, 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 <laughs> <laughs> like nudity would start becoming dominant or would it be just the opposite? Like. Oh, that guy's naked. He must have teleported. They're like, yeah. oh, that's against, that's against the law. You <laughs> yeah. can't do that. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. No. Uh, naked teleporter. Ah. That, and that's the beautiful thing about fiction is if you just <laughs> we're supposed to be talking about the advancement of basic technology levels, and we're talking about naked teleporting. How did we get here? <laughs> well, I mean, I think naked teleporting is a logical conclusion. Completely of where logical going. forward step in and technological man-made technological advancements. But I mean, that's the great thing when you write fiction, though. You can take one of these ideas that you have. 
whether it's what would teleporting do, uh, what, what would this effect be, or, you know, in fantasy, <clears throat> what would the magical uh, consequences be? And you can just play with them. And, 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 and maybe you're going for a ride along with, you know, your, your storytelling to figure out where they would be. Because I know, like, and I can't remember the name of the lady who wrote Hunger Games, said the stories ended up completely different than what she expected them to be. Well, remember, I actually talked about that in yeah, an episode about one not of the too long episodes, ago, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Where the story hijacks itself because it's not going the way you had planned. Now, a lot of times when we, when we talk about technology, we're thinking about stuff like transportation or trades, things that seem to make sense, you know, mm-hmm. like from a technology standpoint, they're not all about technology. The next one is cultural. Mm -hmm. And so that's the idea of uh, the civilizations becoming more structured, more hierarchical, probably, but not necessarily. Mm -hmm. But they develop over time as well, too. It was like one of the interesting things when the the Europeans found some of the big original uh, kingdoms in um, the eastern United States, in Mexico, in South America. Some of them had kingdoms as sophisticated as the kingdoms in Europe when it came to the the pomp the the, the uh, pomp and ceremony of it, mm-hmm. um, and, but, and I assume caste systems and yeah, almost definitely you know caste or class systems all over, and and if you looked at them from just that standpoint, you would say these were equal kingdoms, but you know a lot they were all in the Stone Age. Um, I don't think the wheel was used over here. The wheel, the they, wheel. They didn't use the wheel. I don't believe the wheel was used anywhere in North America until. Until uh, uh, Europeans, Europeans brought it? Mm-hmm. Animals. Wow. And that's one of the things, too. People are like, how, how do they accomplish some of these tasks, like building some of these amazing structures in mm-hmm. Central and South America? And there are places in America that have pyramids um, that most people don't even know about. Like, go to St. Louis, and you can see some pyramids built in America. Actual pyramids. I yeah. believe you. I just yeah. I was unaware of this. Right off of I-70. Yeah. Yeah, there's amazing stuff all over. And, um, and you're like, how? How do you do any of this without a wheel? Because as Westerners, a lot we struggle carrying. We struggle to understand how, like you know, Stonehenge was built, and they didn't have a wheel. We don't think they do. Um, or in where well, they had a wheel in Egypt, but still, I mean, how do you build these things? A wheel. They had the one, just one, <laughs> just the one. It was called. It was called Bob. It was called Bob the Wheel, and <laughs> all of Egypt used it. They had to get in line. Yeah, <laughs> which is why the pyramid building was so. Long. It took a long time. <laughs> Bob was busy for decades building that thing. And then when Bob broke, they mummified him. They mummified Bob. And chucked him in with the animals. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Go back to the mummified animal episode to understand that one. Um, um, much like cultures develop, religions develop. If you take an early religion, and on Earth you can go to places. A ritual sacrifice. Uh, yeah. You can, you can still go to places on Earth where uh, that are very isolated. And uh, Mike and I have talked about there's two in particular places where it's common to find very isolated things. Michael. Michael. The Amazon and in Indonesia for some reason. Those two places seem to be where Well, they, didn't you say there was also uh, – I was talking about islands and I couldn't remember where. And Indonesia. You said yeah. th- that was uh, mm-hmm. Indonesia. Okay. Yeah. Uh, which is just a bunch of islands. But there are so many remote places there that uh, – was it you were talking about the plane crashing or you can't go into the one island? The one the island where yeah. like, like it's – and, and the, the thing about that island in particular is it's, it's pretty close mm-hmm. to – other areas that are developed like it's mm-hmm. not that far away it's they're, not a, they're by their own desire isolated and as respected for some reason but yeah. they haven't well i mean they're geographically isolated because it's an island mm-hmm. but the point is that their their technology has not advanced over hundreds and hundreds yeah. of years they're, they're they're like old school tribal and cannibalistic mm-hmm. and people don't go there because if you land on the beach they come kill you and eat you on the beach because you taste like chicken right which is delicious I, but you gotta you gotta wonder what they think though because there are I want to say that there are boat routes and plane routes oh, near that island yeah. so they must see some things and wonder you but know? but think about you know why are there so many thunder gods why are there so many gods of the ocean mm. you know you they'll come up with stories yeah oh yeah of course they'll explain it it somehow. will change them still just seeing it but if the technology doesn't go there they can culturally sort of remain different um religions around the iron age is is where most of the modern religions come from christianity came around back then 
Uh, you, you could argue Islam might have been a little after the Iron Age, probably more in the what we call medieval era. Um, but uh, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, all these really kind of came into their own in the Bronze and Iron Ages. And uh, that was sort of now, a, a, it, an advancement over earlier religions. Would you say that that goes back to lending itself where different technologies are feeding on each other, like those religions were coming into their own as our transportation advanced, as our cultures could spread? Almost and, definitely. Yeah, okay. You know, I mean, people say the reason the Roman Empire became Christian was because of the roads. Hmm. You know, essentially, the roads let them spread the story around, and then you started having people... The message appealed to people, so people started believing in the message of, well, maybe it sucks down here, but I can go to heaven afterwards. And so the message was appealing, and even though it was a persecuted religion by the Hellenistic Greeks, uh, viciously persecuted at times, and from what I've learned in Western culture, probably most of the time, even though you had that persecution going on, the religion grew and grew, and it completely displaced the old Stone Age religion of the Hellenistic Greeks, which... And it's of itself was developing and it w- would have been completely different at that point. And if you would have gone into a, a, you know, a Greek temple 500 years before that, it would have looked completely different. Now the basic norms would have grown along with it, but it would become more structured over time. Um, and a lot of the cultural changes, you know, like if there's a kingdom, you know, you, you start to get a growth of a head of the church. Sometimes it is the king and sometimes it's not the king. But these things, cultural and religion, I, I think, very much grow hand in hand to each other. The religion will, in a way, mimic the the culture. Um, maybe not exactly. I think too. And they I would, each I would, other. I would agree with that up until a, a cultural advancement point. I wouldn't say that that's necessarily accurate to like modern day America. To a degree, because we're still very much a Puritan country, like we have these big holdover ideals in in our politics and in our um, in our ethical mm-hmm. um, overlooks of society mm-hmm. that are they just come from old Puritan thought. Yeah, but I wouldn't say that. I would say that that's a holdover influence as opposed to a modern religious inf- influence. Yeah, I mean, most of the modern re- religions aren't, and, and, and but they're not really religious. They are, but they're like I said. They're, the Puritans were a form of Christianity mm-hmm. that uh, was basically persecuted in Europe and moved over here after after uh, Oliver got his head chopped off. Pretty much, they weren't like anywhere in England. I shouldn't get his head chopped off, but well, he did after he died. When the new King Charles uh, retook the throne, uh, they, I believe, cut his body into parts and sort of displayed them all over the country to let people know that the Puritan age had ended. No, it's done. <laughs> yeah. And, um, run away <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to America. Um, just to, uh, just to quickly recap, we're not finished with the list here, but what we've gone through so far is agriculture, energy, communication, trades, uh, transportation, cultural, religious. We still got a couple more, but mm-hmm. I just want to point out that Jeff wrote all these up on the board and next to that is a bunch of columns. Mm-hmm. So what we're going through here is not just a list. It's actually a chart. Mm-hmm. And we'll, we'll get to that exactly in the wrap up. But, um, so um, after religious, what have you got? Uh, scientific. And I kind of put this as one, and you could definitely break this one up, up into more areas. But I, I, I didn't want to do that because to me, it's more the, the scientific process, not any of the individual sciences. So, you know, you're referring to scientific method coming up with the scientific okay. method and, and sort of evolving that the process of science, not mm-hmm. any individual, not a, not a particular science, but the fact that there is a, you know, a process, a method. There, there's to, a method that sort of changes over time and becomes better. And, pre- and a lot of people say it deviates off of religion. Um, I would say it grows with religion to a point and then. Once you get to the scientific method, that's where it deviates because it becomes more. It becomes its own thing. It, it becomes focused on unobservable experiments rather than religion, um, w- which drive a lot of the observations before that. Um, now, you also have magical here. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious. People to, might be interested in why I'd have this on a tech yeah, chart. Yeah. And the reason I do is to track it. And for me, it, when I develop my world, magic grows alongside of technology Mm. and people become better and they learn quicker cheaper uh trickier techniques to perform magic much the same way they would figure out how to do it for farming 
how they could do it for the production of computers, all of that stuff. Uh, people have become better at doing things over time. And so I want to be able to track that alongside of the actual tech levels for two reasons. One is to know how advanced, you know, they've become. The more advanced they be- become, they can create maybe more and new different types of spells, if you want to use an old game term or an old magic term there. How, how developed the r- rituals have become. And I also think that in a way, magic will actually help hold back technology uh, be- uh, because why do you spend so much time figuring out how to make iron swords if you can just pull them out of the ground? And you're like, well, this metal is harder. Let me do something here and see if I can turn this thing into a sword like, like we have those other kinds of swords. So maybe your ability to, uh, in, a, in trade-wise, create swords maybe the trades become somewhat diminished because the magic is being used instead of the actual traditional way of doing it hey you've mentioned that before actually in one of the other episodes Mm -hmm. so did you want to go across the top chart or uh not not completely but i want to describe a little bit the chart concept so essentially i have a spreadsheet and uh this will be going out to everyone who who to sign up for my newsletter. How would I sign up for the newsletter? You would go to gardool.com, and I don't want to say slash newsletter because I don't know if that's actually the link, but uh, there is a button at the top of the page for the newsletter. There's a pop-up at the top of the page, uh, a little bar that will come across that you can sign up for in the right in the right hand column. There's a box where you can sign up for the newsletter. And the newsletter will come to you in the form of an email, in the, the form coolest of an email, email mm-hmm. you'll ever get. And there, there will be actually a, a whole bunch of freebies because as I, I develop a new newsletter i put it out there if there's a freebie you'll be able to get to it via the newsletter mm-hmm. um, and what would be an example of a freebie so right now the freebies are there is the maps of podcastia there is the mind map for framework world building uh which is just a giant mind map talking about all these areas where i talk about cultures and states and places i think you showed races this. I think yeah, I've you, seen yeah this you've one. seen this yeah one. yeah and, in the maps episode, you talk. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, it's the type of a map. And so essentially the, there's a free my map and there's maps for a world. If, if you want some geography, you know, let's say you you world build and it's just a, a blank map and it'll show you the weather. It'll show you the altitudes. It'll show you up and down below sea level, I believe. Uh, but it, it's a free world for you to play around with to practice world building. Or if you run a game, just use it. I mean, it's free. Why not? Especially if you don't like to make geography. I don't know why you wouldn't, but there might be someone out there who doesn't want to make geography. I can't imagine. <laughs> and so, essentially, I'll, I'll put in a spreadsheet in a PDF version of, of the chart. And essentially, I have one for cultures until they become wrapped up in states, and then I have one for states. And, but, of course, the one we're talking about today is tech, tech level. Is tech? What I'm saying is I have a tech level for a culture, so early on, if they don't going to the modern day nation states it will be attached to the culture gotcha. um but once they start becoming broken down into maybe this one country or maybe a couple different countries the country one becomes the overriding chart because you know the bedrackum chart replaces um uh the chart for the culture when the state is developed and essentially it, it's just a spreadsheet where you can actually mark down where they are at each of the different categories we recovered today from agriculture all the way through magic. So would you like would take this chart and you'd be like, this is my culture number five. Like you'd yeah. pick, pick a culture on your, in Name your, of the in culture. your story mm-hmm. and then you would mark down in the chart each thing where their tech level is at. Yeah. And, okay. And, and, and the reason I like it is, you know, especially when you have a lot of cultures, it brings you back to where they are. Is this? That's that, the top. Okay. I oh, and so the old tech level that we talked about in the older episode is the top of it, and the side are all of the things that uh, we've gone over today from agriculture through magic. And um, essentially, you can just mark it up quickly, and then later on, especially like if you're a part-time writer because you work, you know, and you have a family, you maybe don't have enough time, it'll help keep you in the same place. So, you know, if you're thinking of, oh, I need some kind of agricultural tool, you know, you can say... Wait, these guys are Bronze Age Earth. Let me just hop on Uncle Google and they will tell me something that a Bronze Age Earth thing. 
And you can either use the exact implement or come up with some variation along the lines of that that fits with a culture slash race that you're working with. So what is the world builder task of the day? Yes, it would be to apply the simple, succinct tech level method to your base culture or if it's a state, your state, whichever it is, it doesn't matter. And I'm going to re- reiterate, like the easy way to do that would be get the newsletter because then you'll just get the chart. You'll mm-hmm. get a PDF of the chart and you can and you just use it that way because we didn't cover the entire chart verbally and it's going to be much easier if you yeah. have the, the sheet in front mm-hmm. of you. Most definitely. And now, uh, yeah. <laughs> you got lost there for a second. Professionalism. Professionalism. Uh, the real world task of the day is to watch The Story of Maths, which is a documentary. Yes, this is a documentary about math, which very few people would probably recommend to other people. But um, <laughs> but we, we do here. We do here. And the reason it's very interesting is it, it, it looks at the development of math through different spectrums, through the Western tradition, through the Middle Eastern tradition, through the uh, uh, Asian tradition, and just I kind of subscribe to the Tom Lehrer uh, tradition. No. The the new math. There's no new math. Yep, Tom Lehrer he talks all about it. Look up Tom Lehrer new math. Actually, you should do that. You should do that. You should do that. I'm I'm gonna stop being a jerk and, and pretend like I don't know what he's talking about and yeah, be yeah. mad because you should listen to me. Yeah, you totally should. And um, yeah, no uh. But it, it sort of looks at the development of math, and it, it gets surprising, you know, like we have preconceptions like, you know, Newton came up with calculus. Yeah, he, he re-came up with calculus. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, definitely the Greeks were very big into abstract math. Can I totally segue? Did you know that Newton... Um, it's also a cookie? Newton had a breakdown when he was in early in, I think in his early fifties. Yeah. And when he, after he had that, um, I forget who it was like a friend of his, a professional colleague, Mm -hmm. but friend who said that you should become the, I'm trying to remember the term, um, the protector of the mint or ambassador of the mint or something like this. Okay. So, and this is in, um, uh, in England. So he basically became the guy that, was protector of the currency. Mm -hmm. What he discovered was that one third of the money at that time was counterfeit. And he made it his personal mission Mm. to, uh, to find it turned out it very much became a Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty story because, and I'm not, and this is true. This is Mm -hmm. real. This happened. Mm -hmm. They're they're developing a movie for it Mm -hmm. that this guy whose other, whose name I know, but I can't remember now because I just heard it the other day. Uh, His foil was this genius mastermind forger Mm -hmm. who was creating all this counterfeit and, and he was very charismatic. And when Newton finally caught like this whole ring and he caught them all, including this guy, Mm -hmm. And this guy was very arrogant, like, I'll get off. I will not be prosecuted, da 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 And he mm-hmm. did get off. But the other guys were all hung. Newton continued after the guy and caught him a second time. And the second time, Newton acted as the prosecutor. And the guy acted as his, as, as his, as his own defense. And he was hung mm. the second time. So here you have Isaac Newton, someone who's known for something mm-hmm. completely different. Which he he actually already developed calculus at this point. Right. Mm -hmm. And he had this whole other incredibly interesting, Mm -hmm. very significant event. Um, I I won't even say event because it took years. Yeah. But this, you know, huge thing that that occurred in his life that he was a part of that very – I'd never heard it before. Which actually explains something that was told me earlier. The breakdown part I I knew about. I didn't know about the stuff afterwards, but – I remember, and I don't remember where I was watching this, some documentary, I'm sure. Of course. <laughs> um, where they were talking about how the thing that was odd was all of his, you know, brilliant scientific achievements happened before he was 50. Hmm. And a lot of people think that's what led to his breakdown, which ended up creating a whole different life for him, which might also be why he didn't have the big breakthroughs in science afterwards, because he wasn't working on science. He was breaking counterfeiting ones, <laughs> which maybe we'll, we'll have to do an episode on money at some point because it's very important to states, and we'll talk about that at some point. So, yeah, your uh, real-world task of the day is watch the story of maths. Yes, and see how brilliant some of these people are and how, and how the math sometimes disappeared again. Mm. 
You know, like the Greeks, very abstract thinkers. Uh, they came up with ways to measure the circumference of the earth, the distance between the earth and other heavenly bodies, some amazing stuff. And I believe that happened in Mesoamerica as well, separately in, in, in China as well. And, um, then the Romans took over, which were great mathematicians, but Romans were very utilitarian. You know, they liked math for producing giant practical, practical purposes. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the abstract math kind of floated away until Isaac Newton brought back calculus. So don't forget, blame Newton if you struggle in college. (laughs) Jeff, tease me. All right. (laughs) The next episode, Notebooks of Doom. And as always, make sure to go to Garduel.com. That's G-A-R-D-U-L.com for the show notes. They'll be under podcasting, world builders, and that's a great place to get all of the information from the episode that you just listened to and to see all the resources that we've talked about in this episode. Thanks for joining us this episode of the World Builders Anvil. Please be sure to rate and review us in iTunes, and please help get the word out to your friends about our show. And join me, Jeffrey W. Ingram at Garduel.com to see the progress of my world and learn why I made the choices I did. And please contact me and let me know the topics you would love to hear in the future. Now strike, why the myth rolls high.